14. My name is Rohan. I'm your chair, and with me are two trainees whose name I do not know. Without further ado, I'd like to invite the government. Here, here. Yeah. Could you say what the motion you guys are doing? Uh, this house believes that self-identified pro-choice activists who have had an abortion should not be right. I get the message. That's fine. Ready when you are. Mr. Chair, while we recognize that the expression of regret and grief is a personal choice, you have to understand that these self-identified protest activists are embodiments of these movements. Who are self-identified uh, activists of any uh, of any stance? Right? These are not just any willy-nilly person who has decided to forward a cause or join an NGO or a campaign. These women who have taken it upon themselves willingly to push forward a cause. These are embodiments of a movement. These are people who have spent their entire lives telling others that this uh, that this stance is correct, who have been telling women all over the world that your choice, your bodily autonomy is what you should be fighting for and what I'm helping you to achieve. Even these are self-identified women. Therefore, we think whenever these self-identified women voices out a stand that is contradict contradictory to pro-choice, it means that they are the voice of the movement and they are voicing out a contradictory stand, which is hurtful to the movement as a whole. Our position might come here and say, well, the, the voice of these women is the counter-narrative that they can provide to people who might be thinking of going off pro-life. We don't think that's true because we think that, uh, the, uh, we think, uh, the ideas of pro-choice and pro-life are so out there in the open that women can take a choice nonetheless and they can in take an informed choice nonetheless. Yeah. So we don't think that this particular expression of grief is something that can provide an informed choice which doesn't exist in status quo. Sit down. I'll get straight to the harms of what this uh, public uh, public uh, expression of grief and regret does, right? Number one, it contradicts their very status. Number two, it strengthens conservative narrative. Number three, it leads to losing of critical mass. Number four, how this is a sign of concession and ultimately weakens the pro-choice uh, pro uh, pro movement as a whole. Number one, how it contributes their stance. You have to understand that because these women were so headstrong, because these women were the embodiment of the movement, they are the people who attracted followers. This is because of these women, the, uh, the other women all over the world see themselves as powerful enough to make a choice to tell their husbands, to tell their fathers that they can make a choice about their body. This is this is why they, they joined the bandwagon. Now what you do is tell these women that the spearhead of your movement has decided to change their stance. Now these, yeah. now these followers will see a different point of view from the very person who has been strengthening the cause which they so strongly believe in. Because of that very women, what you do is make pro-life, uh, pro-choice women doubt themselves. The very principles of choice that they believed in will be doubted because the because of the spearhead of this very choice is doubtful. Because the spearhead of this choice is telling you that the choice I made was regrettable. The choice I made is something which I shouldn't have. What you what you do is dilute the faith Man. that these women have in the principle of choice in the first place. So therefore, we think it's a very contradictory stand to these women who have been telling women all over the world that this is something you should believe in. It dilutes the faith of women in pro-choice. Secondly, it strengthens conservative narrative. What you have what you have to what you have please sit down. What you have to see is that these the opposition of uh, uh, people who keep on attacking women for the choices they make will have a leeway now to tell other women that the choices that women make are fickle, that women don't know what they want, that women can never believe what they uh, what the choices they made are true, that women are always going to regret what they do. This is what opposition will say. This is how you strengthen conservative movement. This is how the conservatives will tell all women 
all around the world that the very person who is forwarding your cause is regretting the choice that they make. This means women are un unable to make a choice in the first place, and men should be the one who make choices for them. Your fathers and your husbands should be, and the church should be the people who is making a uh, choice for them. Now the conservative parents will tell their daughter that you, you cannot get an abortion because the person who you were idolizing in the first place regretted the abortion. Therefore, we have no interest in believing uh, the principles that you're forwarding to us. Therefore, we think it strengthens the conservative narratives and gives so much leeway for attack, which is going to be the movement. Before I move on, yes. Why can't these pro choice families express their kind of feelings of regret? What are the same distance supporting their pro choice positions? We don't think that those two things can work in the same way. Because once you tell women that the choice I make is regrettable, that I shouldn't have made this choice, what you do is dilute other women who wanted to make that choice in the first place. What you do is the very argument I told you now, that you give leeway to the conservatives to tell all other women that your choice is something that's regrettable, that you are unable in the first place to make a choice because women are fickle-minded and cannot have a strong opinion. Thirdly, what this does is lose its critical mass. All those women who in the first place join in the movement because of you will now <coughs> will now see it as something which wasn't strong in the first place. What the media will do will obviously blow this expression of regret in brief out of proportion. What this media will do will never give a chance to this woman you're talking about to ever explain herself. Because the moment she says that I regretted my choice, the media will blow it out of proportion and tell the whole world that the pro-choice activist doesn't believe in the thing that she is preaching, therefore we should ditch this cause, therefore we should never take this cause seriously. The, the media will never give the time in the airspace to allow this woman to explain, to give nuances to why she believes she could, could have had an abortion at the same time be a pro-choice activist. Oh, yeah. Therefore, we think it loses the critical mass, it loses your ability to explain yourself, not only to other women, but to the media as a whole, and tell them that I can be both at the same time. This is why we don't think these people can do both. Before six, yes. Fourthly, okay. how we think that this is a sign of concession. You have to understand that these are very polarized movements pro-choice and pro-abortion. This means that the followers of these movements need, need the strength, they need a strong stance, and any sign of weakness pushes away and derails the movement. All the things that I've talked to you about, how it strengthens conservative narratives and you give, allow them to attack you, how you lose critical mass, how you tell your followers that what I was believing in wrong and I couldn't and I would have made another decision. What this does is a sign of concession. You tell you tell the public that the choice that uh, you tell the public that our movement is not as strong as it should have been, and you tell the public that well you could have been pro-abortion. Look, we are not pro-life or pro-choice. What we tell you is if a woman has taken it upon herself to forward a cause, and this and the faith of other women all around the world who believe in the same thing depends on her forwarding the cause. We think it is her responsibility to push it. And this expression of trust and grief is something that is very feminist movement because it strengthens the conservative <coughs> because it tells women all around the world that you cannot make a choice because your choice is fickle and women do not know what they want in the first place. We realize that expression is a personal choice, but when a woman has taken it upon herself to forward this cause, we don't think she has the freedom to do so because the fate of other women depend on her. We are very proud to do this. Right. I thank the lead uh, prime minister and invite the leader of the opposition. The promise of the pro choice movement was not to say that all women will have consequence free decisions that every single time that they have an abortion, it will be fine and then be after death. But what the pro-choice movement promises is that regardless of what kind of consequences there may be and what kind of trade-offs you have chosen to make, at the end of the day, you as a woman deserve the choice and the bodily autonomy to decide what you want to do with your body. We believe that the exclusion of this natural human emotion from the discourse of abortion is firstly immoral, Secondly, it regresses the pro-choice movement. And lastly, it hurts the women who go through these very same emotions. So let us deal with the first issue. Why do we think it is the moral and responsible thing to do for these self-professed uh, pro-choice feminists, to, uh, pro-choice activists to go out there and talk about their, uh, their emotions? 
Because these are women who have been sowing in their belief of the pro-choice cause, right? They spent out countless hours campaigning for it, yet, but yet they're experiencing something they did not expect, they did not consider. So if you're telling other women out there, and you have been telling women out there, you're telling legislators that women ought to have a choice, we think it's also their responsibility to play the consequences given that it's crucial in granting this choice to women as a whole. So we believe that they, at the end they need to ensure that they tell a comprehensive view and tell women that to allow women to appreciate that there are consequences behind the choice to abort. And, and, and they themselves as a woman can recommend for yourself those consequences and make a trade off if they wish to do so. Yes. Do you think that the Republicans will ever take a pro-choice uh, activist seriously if she comes there publicly telling We believe that a Republican will never ever take a pro-choice activist seriously in the first place. But we believe that it grants a more credible story to the pro-choice movement, which I'll talk about later on. So what we say, members of the South, is that on the other side, what they're trying to do is to explore something that these women know are part of the process of abortion, and we think that's fundamentally immoral, and it basically uh, goes into the whole idea that we just politicize the issue and not allow women the full spectrum and the full view of what the kind of decisions they would make. But we think that more importantly is the idea that this advances the pro-choice cause. What they want to say is that it contradicts the pro-choice cause. We don't think so, right? Right now, the debate takes place between choice and life is that, and the core argument for the other side is that women always regret, women always grieve, and that in itself is proof that abortion is wrong, that we shouldn't support abortion. We believe that what they're doing here is appealing to sheer emotion and the cognitive bias that regret and, 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 and grief is always something that is a fundamental goal. And that Anything else should be you know, a secondary to this, right? At the moment that this thing exists, you should not make that particular choice. We think that actually, in actual fact, there's absolutely nothing to do with that particular position, right? Me feeling grief for, you know, utilizing my parents because they are really, really sick. There's absolutely no, no, no bearing on why I made that decision in the first place because I didn't want my parents to suffer. It's a normal human emotion. Yeah. So what we argue here is that emotions are a normal human being that comes about with any important life decision. And abortion is one of those decisions that come about. So like their argument and their idea that abortion should be this consequence-free thing is highly unrealistic in the first place. And it allows this other movement to gain traction. Because the other side can go up there and say, look, women always regret, women always grieve, and therefore it is something that we should not do. And the argue on the other side uh, right now is that the response now by the pro-choice movement is that, well, these women don't exist. These women are not relevant, right? They are actually okay with it. In fact, that, that lack of rebuttal to that particular narrative is particularly problematic because right now, number one, it's immensely difficult to get women who were <laughs> okay with their experiences and felt that grief, but I will not were able to get over it to kind of talk about it because they feel shameful about it. But more importantly, at the end of the day, we think that right now on our side, we have this bunch of women who believe in the cause, who are able to stand up and break the media and go out and talk about their experiences. We think that they should do it. And what it does members of this house is that they're able to explain themselves. What they argue was that, oh well, the media will listen to you, right? They'll pull it out of caution. But we say that just as the conservative media is really, really good at uh, protecting this like, narrative of grief. What we do is that we provide the liberal media the ability to go out there and say, look, there are these women out there who are able to explain their consequences and choices, and we think that that's a good thing, right? Because now there's a credible argument for choice to exist in the light of consequences, right? So women can go out there and say and relay their stories and provide very real experiences as to why, even though they felt this regret and grief, they still support women who have this particular choice. And we think that politicians find it incredible incredibly difficult to believe that there are absolutely no consequences, right? And when, when you provide this no remarkable to this idea that grief and regret is something that uh, exists, what you do is that you make it harder for, uh, you create a very unrealistic depiction of abortion. What we do is that we have a very strong narrative and allow, uh, allow the public to understand that this is a choice with consequences, but yet it's still a choice that deserves to be made. And women, on their on hand, can make those choices on their own, which is why we believe that you will advance the pro-choice case. But more, but more importantly, there's another group of women we really care about as well, which is that the, the women who have aborted and feel that particular kind of regret and grief, right? In their world, that particular narrative is ignored. The pro-choice people go out there and say, well, you do not exist, right? What we see as a result is that it compounds the hurt that these women feel because there's no real support group that these women can find, right? Conservatives who do talk about it shame them and say, see, we told you, we told you so, right? You shouldn't have done it. Right, they have a political agenda when they do that. And we think that secondly, women in general who face a lot of trouble don't come out publicly talk about it because they regretted that decision. They think it's something shameful. What we do, members of this house, uh, and, and what happens is that it's a very slow experience and make it very hard to cope. What we do on our side is that we allow these women out uh, 
pro-choice feminists who have records of this decision, who know that, 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 that they were legitimate in making those choices and they, have, they actually were able to make that particular trade-off. Go out there and speak to these women, right? And those experiences that they speak of will be more genuine for these women, they will really find support. And this is something that someone else views as well, and this is not something that is wrong. And I made those decisions based on something I thought was correct. And this, we think this is the most accessible form of support that is available to these women that is not present on the other side. Moreover, what we say is that what this creates is an is, is acknowledgement in the media and an acknowledgement in society that this sort of women exists. That abortion does not end when you step out of the operating theatre and there's a need to provide support for women even after the abortion, right? And we think that what this does is that it allows for, for the government of support for this sort of support and this sort of consequences of dealing with abortion. We think that that is also <coughs> something responsible that a pro-choice movement should do. For all these reasons, we are proud to oppose. Thank the leader of opposition, and I'd like to invite the deputy prime minister. Here, here. Thank you, Ladies and gentlemen, in my speech, you will hear, you will hear me answering the question. <coughs> Firstly, what are the basic promises of a pro choice organization? What are they fighting for? And what does the expression of it actually mean to this movement? Secondly, on the issue of how will the media react to such a public expression of grief and regret? Ladies and gentlemen, I'll move dive straight into my issue. What are the basic premises, essentially the basic premises of a good choice organization? <laughs> yes, you're talking about making a choice with that sort of consequence. However, at this stage in the fighting for the woman's ability and right towards uh, towards right to exercise their choice, it is generally conflated that, that the consequence will be a happy one. Ladies and gentlemen, when the protest when the protest organization sticks up this cause, they will mainly basically argue that by exercising that choice, you are able to attain the happiness, the general happiness, the general control over your human life. Hence, let's move on towards what does actually expression of regret actually mean? We think the expression of regret is directly contradictory towards that message of happiness. How so? Because when you regret over having conducted an abortion, that's a tacit, a tacit, tacit concession. You are essentially you are regretting over a loss of somebody's life. You are essentially addressing a, 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 a person of regret and grief over killing your own baby, ladies and gentlemen. Hence, yes, we do admit that, 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 that when you're fighting for culture organization, you are in fact fighting for a choice with consequences. But at this initial stage of fighting for a culture organization, the, 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 stance that is more, the stance that is more beneficial towards a culture organization is by closely linking it towards the attainment of happiness. So, but then they were talking about how. But then they were talk, also talking about about this. Uh, they talking about how these individuals necessarily retain the right to have that portrayal of realistic expectations to other women. We think this is already provided within the status quo because Sarah already came up here. The debate the, the, the over the product of religious organization is a highly a contentious issue. So what usually happens now that the the usually happens now the women on the ground can already. Can already have a counter narrative to balance out the narrative provided by the pro life organization. But the thing is, but the thing about, we're talking about a pro organization is this that the, if the views and the styles taken up by these activists is often conflicted with the movement as a whole. So when that particular person that she regrets over her decision is often conflicted with the movement as a whole. So what does this mean on the people on the ground? Sarah brought up the example of, our, of, of, a, of a young girl. Who, who aspires to think this activist as an inspiration. But when this activist admits to us that regret, the conservative parents would point to that example and say, even your idol, for example, makes a regret over a decision. What does this mean to the approach of us organization? Again, the narrative that now, the narrative, the conservative narrative that women are fickle, women cannot make up their mind, 
is further strengthened under their under their under this under their proposal. Ladies and gentlemen, what we need for women on the ground right now is so that these women are more and more empowered to have that kind of abortion. This is especially important for the so, minor, for the liberal minorities in a very conservative state where there's a general, general, general push towards the conservative stance. We think that feminist movement cannot give any legal excuse for conservative so, narratives to be strengthened so, in that particular manner. Yes, Tim. Regret and grief are emotions and narratives that we advance regardless of our policies. Isn't it better to have at least some sort of story and credible explanation as to how you make those choices and people reconcile them rather than have an absence and a denial that these things exist? We think that it's better, we think it's better for these women in particular to deny that exists within themselves. We don't necessarily accept that we don't necessarily accept the burden that all women out there yeah. have to deny the existence of regret and grief. But we're talking about a specific group of women who are essentially continuously calling for women to exercise their choice in abortion. By exercising that choice in abortion, you are able to attain general happiness over your life. We think the stance taken by the specific group of women should be inherently different from stances of other women who don't necessarily call themselves pro-choice activists. But on another level, they were also talking about compounding the hurt. Ladies and gentlemen, we already think that the support group for women who had an abortion already exists. In fact, they are mandated by laws, for example, for abortion clinics to have that sort of counseling to it, to have that sort of counseling towards their patient. But let's move on to another issue. How would the media react to such expression? Ladies and gentlemen, what we contended in our first argumentation is this. When this woman expresses their regret in such a public manner, it will be co-opted by the conservative media. The thing is, the nuance of argument that she like to make that her choice of that her her conduct her regret over that abortion is regretful and her stance over pro life is a heavily nuanced and complicated argument. But the thing is, the mainstream media will not be able to pick up that kind of nuance. What they usually depend on is the sound bites, sound bites that will usually be propagated among the society. What are the examples of this sound bite? A pro-choice activist, a pro-choice activist contradicts the science and regrets, uh, regrets the decision of abortion. And this sound bites will be more pervasive among conservative media where this is obviously being propagated. Now they were saying that the liberal media will obviously have a counter measure to this. But the liberal media only serves to give it towards the liberal, liberal, uh, liberal folks already. So it doesn't change any views. But the thing is that we need conservative media to transmit the views towards the conservative parties and not provide any excuses for the conservative societies and conservative media to attack, uh, to attack this movement or based on any signs of fitness. But furthermore, we say, but my society is a material is this. When you, when you essentially admit over your regret, you are essentially igniting the sparks of a, of a woman who has had an abortion. And there are plenty of pro-life women activists who have had an abortion. What usually happens is this. When there's this admit of a grief and regret, this will usually be co-opted by pro-life women who has in fact had an abortion. So what usually happens now, the nuance argument will not surface, but will instead be buried by the narrative of pro-life women who has had an abortion and the focus is more on the regret over that life rather than the so-called nuance of argument, nuance argument that they are coming from. Ladies and gentlemen, when we're talking about this notion, necessarily we are not talking about all women. We are talking about a specific set, a specific group of women who have made an incessant call for women to exercise their choice of abortion. And by exercising that choice of abortion, you are able to attain general happiness. By contradicting your message, you are disempowering women on the ground who may not yet have an abortion and may never have an abortion. I thank the Deputy Prime Minister and I'd like to invite the Deputy Leader of Opposition. Thank you. What the other side stands for essentially is to make self-proclaimed families who experience the trauma and the emotions of going through 
and abortion lie about their experiences, cover up and ignore these experiences, and keep it away from the public domain. You think that's something that's unconscionable? You think it's something that's immoral? You think that's something that piece of information, something that people ought to know, that the movement ought to know in order to advance its cause, in order to react to the kind of countervailing forces that exist within the spectrum of the movement's cause, the particular, particularly the conservative movement. What I'm going to address in my substantive is tell you how, in the absence, or at least in the presence of this disclosure, you allow for a greater amount of counter narratives to emerge. And you don't isolate people the way in which their policy does. We think their policy and their direction isolates individuals who might be pro-choice activists or pro-choice supporters from this discussion. We think that's important. And, that, and we think that their model essentially is what loses critical mass in the long run. A couple of points of rebuttal to what we heard from that side. The first thing is this our conception of what it means to be pro-choice. I think Kenneth already quite nicely laid out to me that being pro-choice isn't necessarily be making a choice that is imminently or as a certainty a happy one. We argue that the idea of abortion is a choice that comes with consequences. However, it is a right that ought to continuously be protected, which is why we argue that the right <coughs> of or at least the individual or the individual woman is the one who has the sovereignty and right to decide whether or not she wants to accept that propensity and chance of an or any form of grief. We argue that ignoring that particular view and painting the very rosy picture and a very unrealistic picture of what an abortion right is, what it means to be pro-choice, is what essentially reveals the conservative the, the, the pro-choice movement and allows them and opens them up to the kind of narrative that comes from the conservative movement and the hijack. But what did they tell us in those points? They said, well, you know, ultimately there are these private internal discourse and narratives that can occur. You know, just say like other women experience this and you know, we can acknowledge it. It's just that we can't say it ourselves. We think that first of all, one, one, one level that's just outright hypocrisy. And we argue that those feminists themselves might not be able to advocate in that way in as strong a fervor as possible because of the cognitive dissonance. But on a deeper level, we think that's quite we don't think the kind of internal narrative is nest is enough because we understand the concept of the pro-choice movement, they're a public figure, they're the ones who are institutionalized and the ones who can best push the true and fair position of the cause. We think that by neglecting their position, we undermine the kind of cause that's being put forward in the first place. We think a private internal narrative is not enough. No, thank you. But then they brought up the analogy of like parent and child, you no know, conservative parent, liberal child. First of all, we don't think that necessarily exists, right? To the extent that we think that the liberal child will never still get a chance and opportunity to make that abortion, given the kind of force, the social forces that act on him, we argue that what we should educate the liberal child, the, the, or at least a potentially liberal child about, is a more true and realistic picture of what abortion rights are about. It's about understanding that there are consequences behind action. You might encounter a certain degree of grief, a certain degree of regret, and it's something that's part and parcel. That is how the child gains the nuanced understanding. It's not about appreciating the rosy picture, because then ultimately what you get is like potentially liberal for a moment, and then after that, switch back to you know like conservatism the moment experience some kind of regret. We are for a more sustainable type of discourse, you need to recognize the deeper extent of the debate. And that's what our side does. Because in the absence of this, what you have is that the liberal movement then proceed is seen as a bunch of hypocrites. They don't recognize reality. No thank you. But then they say, well, there are conservative states. And these conservative states, you know, will basically run circles around this kind of narrative. A number of points of the bottom. The first thing I want to say, like, conservative media will always exist, and they always keep it out in particular view. Like Kenneth already talked about it. We argue that if feminists make this a priority in the way in which they advance their cause, it's more about reconciling like regret, emotions, consequence away from like and, and yeah. still believing in choice and cause. We think ultimately the conservative media has to engage that point. The conservative media has to, or at least the conservative groups must engage on that level. And we think that's what advances the debate. They are inside the house once the kind of liberal feminists or pro-choice feminists to be stagnant within a static discourse that recognizes a rosy picture. That is not sustainable in a real world, especially considering the kind of movement or this kind of traction that conservative groups have been getting today. We think there are things such as long-form stories that can engage these individuals on the long run. We think the kind of campaigning that's done by women's rights groups can be done to a greater extent to acknowledge this particular nuance. We don't think feminism or pro-choice like this effect, but you disagree. So, assuming that if this is in fact a realistic message, then how would then this realistic message, this nuanced argument, be transmitted to its people on the ground when the media, the civil media, always involved in that? 
Okay, the truth is, you know, like a long time ago, having being pro choice was quite a fringe idea as well. But we still argue that with active amount of campaigning, with active amount of push from the media in general, you get that kind of traction, you get the kind of acknowledgement. Just because it's difficult doesn't mean it's something that we should not do. We think there's some degree of difficulty to convince conservative groups, but we think that's what will allow for a greater amount of push, which is the part, which is the argument that I'll be addressing here now. We argue that what you do under the R model, which exclude this particular point of view, is that the subscribers to feminism or the pro-choice movement that do acknowledge or have experienced a certain amount of emotion and grief, feel betrayed and isolated and left out of the conception of a feminist discourse. We argue this is unpreferable because if you think about it, what is feminism based on? Feminism is based on the understanding of bringing up as many stories and narratives of women who experience those things. It's about recognizing that every woman is equal, her experiences are different, but they are still relevant in advancing a feminist cause. We argue that their policy creates a certain degree of shaming, a shaming effect to the extent that, first of all, feminists cannot be feminists if they have a degree of shame and regret that we want to express. They will internally shame. But more than that, even on the internal level, like supporters themselves, you or these women who are pregnant want their abortion or do feel regret will feel ashamed to bring it up and feel they're less illegitimate to become feminists. You can get isolated. But what's the impact of this point? We argue that failing to acknowledge this view incurs a counter response from the other side of the, of the, of the discussion that's detrimental to the pro choice activists. Why is that so? Because it's very easy for a person or a woman who's experiencing the regret and grief to see that they're being ignored by this liberal pro choice group, don't acknowledge my story at all, to move on to the conservative groups who are propagating the very narrative that, look, see, you were wrong, you, you were right all along, you experienced emotion, you experienced the grief, you experienced the regret, come to the dark side. We <laughs> think that is the harm that their policy perpetuates. They can never solve that under their model. They hurt the feminist movement and kind of progress in aggressive rights overall with a force. Right, I thank the Deputy Leader of Opposition and invite the government. <coughs> yeah, yeah. <coughs> that they do not recognize what is specific of this debate. We believe it's problematic. They do generally argue to us why individuals should be able to voice out their form of regret. But his pain is not just about the idea of a normal activist versus individuals or normal franchise. This debate is about an individual who taking up the responsibility to promote this form of idea of pro-choice. These are self-identified pro-choice activists. These are individuals who promote these ideas and individuals who are viewed as leaders. Individuals who will be given a lot of air time and highlight and the, the action of these individuals will affect not only herself but also the movement and the ideas that she carries. That is why we do not think that this debate is just about normal individuals. And we believe especially if their action can bring this form of consequences, we don't think it's fair for individuals who are actually the flag bearer of this form of pro choice to suddenly argue with you and tell the public that I regret my formal decision. That's why we need to understand what is the exact meaning of regret. A regret is meaning of you remorsing and a remorse and also say that your action that you've taken is something which is disappointing and most of all not meaning that you 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 believe that, that you should not have taken that form of action at all. It's problematic because at the same time you're supposed to forward the idea that you are pro-choice by you, but you regret the action of being a poor choice. We believe that contradictory message no. is something which is or shouldn't be forwarded to a society because it brings a lot of harm in terms of being an ammunition on the other side, which sort of affects the individual who are hollow, right? But then he's trying to argue to us right here that okay, let's 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 discuss the emotional aspect within the decision that they make. Because they say that emotional emotions is needed, emotion needs to be discussed but it's part and partial of the decision and the consequences, right? Where even a pro choice has I have emotion that we discuss and also pro life. But essentially the okay. sentiment, we, we understand that regret can happen, grief can happen, right? So even if we got these individuals voicing out their opinion as such, 
like this form of counter narrative will still be used anyway from the other side. And you could, you can possibly regret your decision as such. So we do not need this individual to so. discuss this in public is self identified, right? But even so, we believe normal individuals who might just follow uh, pro choice can only voice out their opinion and that discussion can happen there. But we don't think the leaders and uh, individuals who are self identified should be the ones who are discussing it because as a trickle down effect, we thought we believe it's problematic in this. And that is why we believe that it's not our burden. And we argue from the very beginning to say that nobody who, to, who are supporting pro choice and science should never discuss this form of idea. We believe there are still individuals so that should not be doing so, and these are the self identified. Uh, so those are individuals who are self identified. Sit down. So, ladies and gentlemen, so let's look at the next issue, right? Uh, let's, go. let's look at the next, next issue, the idea or the message of this form of pro choice. So, because essentially, sit down in a bit, right? So, what are the, the basic premise of this pro choice organization? But see, we essentially believe in this. I mean, this pro choice organization is fighting for the idea that the exercising pro choice is something which is their rights, and exercising their rights is a utility that will lead them to a form of happiness. This is where we believe that if, if this pro choice is supposed to be an idea about happiness, right? We, and, and, and exercising it leads to a form of regret and grief, and voicing out those of, voicing out the regret and grief. Means contradictory that uh, is contradictory to happiness. Means that there's no proper form of utility, and that right shouldn't be exercised in the first place. So meaning here, the very intention of promoting yeah. poor choice is being diminished because your very black brothers are saying that the, that you don't have this utility so, to this poor choice. You regret the choice that you essentially make, and we do not think it's good, especially when a grief. And regret is also something very sub uniquely subjective towards an individual. Maybe all of a sudden he or she will feel regret, but other individuals would not, right? Because they haven't gone through that. But even if they do, they will not have this form of regret. This is we believe is problematic because you will eventually change opinions of people, and we don't think that change of opinion is something which is bad. But before I go on, yes. In the context of Roe v. Wade guaranteeing women the right to vote, isn't it better to focus the pro choice movement? To supporting women who do feel this grief uh, that your your side wants to deny exists in the first place. So we, we will support yeah, we, we, we will support these individuals nonetheless, right? But essentially the problem that we have is is, is like you dimension the, the idea of this pro choice pro choice movement, especially if your message get diluted, because these are the leaders, essentially, right? We believe that the protection of these women will essentially be protected, especially if you still identify yourself as a pro choice. If you no longer pro choice, essentially you can just revert the from stance or decision, we're okay with that. In either side or either stance you have, women will be protected nonetheless because you have support group from both sides of the party, right? So essentially the problem that we have on this, what what's the likely what, what's the likeliness of this narrative of this woman, right? Because essentially what happens later on, these are the women, if their voice on this form of opinion which is contradictory, they, later on, like, there, are, um, there are a lot of perceptions upon that. This is where we argue to you, especially the opposition to a pro choice is especially conservative, right? Like, this, is, this is where we believe that they will, they, will, they will use this as a form of ammunition to pass, and that pro choice is something that you should be regret because someone as influential as that will be promoting as you regret their form of decision. Any other individual who might be inclined towards pro choice now will be shut down because these are the conservative parents or the conservative community say that. See, this is what happens when you go for this form of abortion and such. And we don't think that's good. This is when even women will say that this uh, will be undermined based on the form of decision that we have. And it's not only that. We already argue to you, right, especially with pro choice, as even as we all described, before this wasn't something which is popular, but it has been increasing, right? So this form of support needs to continue. Especially when, when all of a sudden the, the media could focus on sound bites. Meaning here that even if there might be a possibility for reconciliation or such or even explanation, those things wouldn't be given at time. Because individuals who focus on this is your regret and this is your, and this is what everybody should be focusing on. This one individuals essentially are able to get the message forward uh, across the media and we and we believe what happens then the, the narrative to support this form of pro choice doesn't happen anymore. So in fact, eventually the gentlemen, this regret and this grief will be used um, consistently by the other side. And later on, if you want to promote this form of pro choice, doesn't exist anymore in this event. And that's why we call it problematic. What they have not engaged upon them, and argue to us, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, why essentially these individuals, the leaders themselves, 
must must voice out the form of regret is contrary to the whole stance of the pro choice movement. Especially if they're not given a form of uh, fair avenues to promote later on how is it fair at the end of the day. We believe in the seven goals of the All right, I'd like to thank the government whip and to close out the case for the opposition side, I'd like to invite you up. In the context where abortion rights around the world, especially in countries like the United States, have generally been guaranteed by Supreme Court decisions, by legislative advancements, we thought that the pro-choice movement had two important obligations. The first was to advance a deeper understanding of why women made these particular choices and helping to create support that women, be somehow, like, which is somehow today too radical, the notion that women deserve to make their own choices and to decide for themselves what kind of consequences that they might want to experience, or to recognize that they have the full emotional capacity to decide to take on possible consequences. Second, to enhance and accommodate women who make these particular choices, that accommodate their own particular experiences. We thought that under both these particular um, obligations, that the government side is completely filled to prove their case for why the pro-trade activists should act in the manner they say we should act. I want to talk about the first thing about the public narrative and whether or not uh, pro-choice activists acknowledge <coughs> the and is something that supports the pro-choice movement in general of support for abortion rights. Second, I want to talk about the obligations that pro-choice activists have towards women about to make these better choices and women to make these choices and experience those emotions. I want to talk about the first thing. Now, they argue today that this ultimately is amount to contradiction, right? That pro-choice activists should come up and say that their choices were, that their choices were happy, their choices gained them immunity. But here's the thing. The conservative narrative is one that says that women's choices and whether or not women should make a choice is conditional on whether it makes them happy. The conservative narrative is one that says that women can't really know what's good for them. Therefore, an external body has to decide for them whether or not this choice makes them happy or not. When their side comes out and says, our choices make us happy, they buy into the narrative that the only thing that matters is whether or not the women are happy. We think, and we have argued consistently, that cultural activity should stand for something larger. It should stand for something more. It should stand for the idea that women are to be treated like adults. That women are to be treated as informed consumers and people who say, who know that there are possible consequences that I could experience with or regret. But because women are human beings, because women are adult human beings who are respected the full autonomy of choices, that we should take that these are part of the right to choose that no one should control whether or not they should feel grief or regret. That no one should control whether they make choices that they might end up regretting. We didn't think it was right for a family member to infantilize this woman, to say that no, none of us experience those particular things. Therefore, we should make a choice only because it makes us happy. No, we thought that the right to choose was larger than that. It came up because the human beings who decide to take on this risk for themselves. They say next, then that look, they are role, probably a role model, right? Like this, the, this particular uh, the young girl I could ever see, oh, this particular feminist uh, actor has not now has regretted this particular choice, and therefore has something to do with a poor choice movement. But here's the thing, we think it's very important to establish the distinction between regretting a particular choice of abortion which may end up thinking it was a bad choice, and supporting in general the right of other women to choose, or the right of women in general to make their own life decisions. We think that's a narrative that can be more easily, 
that narrative that is more persuasive, we think that's a narrative that is more something that's more powerful when you express in general that women feel adults. And that's the kind of narrative that we want the little girl to hear. Not that she should only make choices that make her happy. Not that she should only make the choices that other people tell her that they're happy. But that she should make choices because she's her own person, recognizing all the possible consequences. That's the narrative that we want to hear. It's more powerful coming from people who've gone through that particular experience. Then they say the media has a particular narrative and a sound bite. It will end up like, you know, uh, confusing, confiscating those things. But here's the thing. We think that it's under their model, the conservative has a narrative that is powerful. Conservative can bring up to look at groups and bring up people who regret their choices and say, look, I regret it. This is why now I'm pro life. There is no adequate response from their side. We all say, look, no, like no women experience or none of us experience this. Therefore, these experiences are legitimate, right? We think that it's better that you contest this directly by saying, look, I have experienced those things, and now I, but I still remain poor choice. We think, in fact, that's an interesting spin on the very old story that we think can gain a kind of traction because there's something that immediately appeals to people or something that's unique and different from the kind of other narratives that you might otherwise have. <laughs> so, a woman choice may lead to a possibility of grief and regret. How would the momentum to give women the ability to choice would be rather than modern services? Because we think the momentum is key when pro choice activists say that women are adults, that even though they might experience grief and regret, that's not a reason to deny them to do something. That's a reason to grant them full information and the ability to say, I still want to make those choices because I'm an adult human being, it's not someone who should who should like be sheltered from making poor choices or be sheltered from making choices that I might feel grief and regret about. That's how we think we should advance the discourse. We think people can buy the discourse. Because now people do accept generally that women are autonomous human beings. Women shouldn't make a better life. Your side is the one that buys the narrative that women should only be given one side of the picture. Women yeah. can't handle emotions like grief or regret. And no, the moment they do these things, like we should shelter them from those things. I think the French women should directly contest the narrative and say we don't shelter women, we support women who make these choices, we allow them to make those choices, and when they make those choices, fair experiences, we support them. And that brings me to the second issue of this debate that they have absolutely no response to. The obligations to women are about to make these choices, and the obligations to people who have experienced those things. The only real argument they make for us is this. Well, you know, there are so, like, supporting cast of characters, ordinary people who can talk about their experiences. But when it comes to the leaders, the people who are most significant, none of them can make those particular admissions. All of them have to say that their experiences were wonderful. That they had an abortion and they felt like fine the next day, right? What does that do? This has, we argue this has two consequences. The first consequence is that this, like, because the narrative is so powerful, right? And the science is so powerful, this completely shuts out the other narratives they talk about, right? This completely like delegitimizes other other narratives talk about. More importantly, this creates the perception. To, to be a real feminist, to be a leader in the feminist movement, you have to have consequences for your partners. That if you don't, if you feel regret, if you feel grief, it means that you weren't a real feminist. It yeah. means that you weren't good enough to become a project activist leader. Because these project activists leader paint and talk to people at the vanguard of feminism. When they when they don't acknowledge other experiences, they're saying that women have experienced these other experiences aren't good enough. Uh, that good enough for them to this movement. We thought that was terrible because that could increase shame on this movement. This meant that this movement were more likely to transfer over to the conservative side and provide more powerful narratives for the other movements. We thought that was bad because the feminist movement should stand for all experiences, should acknowledge all experiences. The leaders in particular should acknowledge that other women out there had those experiences that only they can make that acknowledgement, only they can provide that particular affirmation of what they stand for. This is why I'm very proud to oppose. All right, thank you, Opposition Whip, and I'd like to invite the Opposition to reply. <clears throat> the denial that grief and regret are part of the consequences that exist as a result of an adult decision to avoid is a lie. And what they're essentially saying on site government is that then uh, pro-choice movement supporters and activists should continue to lie <coughs> to the public and say that whenever you are bored, it is all fine and then we are with that. And that is the way that we perceive is the most sustainable way to ensure and guarantee that right. But as we told you, that that's not the biggest issue that we need to tackle right now. That there are women who feel this grief, that there are women that feel this regret, that they will systematically ignore in their case. And that they are 
decision to have this particular policy is an immoral and hypocritical narrative to say that abortion is always consequence free. And what this does is that it hurts the pro choice movement, and secondly, it hurts the women that do feel such regret and do feel such grief. So, first, let's talk about the first issue. Right? Uh, how do we advise the pro choice movement? Their strategy was one to say, well, let's just hide it away, stow it away, and whenever the other side brings it up, we just deny that it exists. Right? But what we have provided you is a much more nuanced approach. Right? Because the reality is right now that uh, when it comes to pro the pro choice pro life debate, it is advantage pro choice. Right? Roe v. Wade and, uh, has really essentially guaranteed the ability of women to avoid abort. And the best argument that's made on the other side, on the other side of our way, on the pro choice side, is to say, um, is to say that you will regret it, right? You'll feel weak, and that in itself is wrong. <coughs> that in itself is good enough reason for you to not have that choice. But what we say is that regardless of whether this felt self, uh, regardless of the testimony of the women that we want to speak up, that particular narrative is always going to exist. The narrative that you are going to regret and therefore you shouldn't have the choice is always going to be present on the other side. But yet this is a narrative that's irrelevant to the debate, right? Because it's a normal emotion. And that's how you feel about making any choice, and uh, especially a choice that's so important. So how do we counteract this particular narrative? They are arguing to say, well, we shouldn't allow this woman to come up because it's co-opted. But the reality is that this argument exists and there's no response right now from the pro-choice side. What we provide is a powerful counter-narrative that is realistic, that is convincing, that is grounded in the experiences of real women that continue to believe that this choice is valid even though they have felt angry, even though they have felt that regret. And they are able to contest the idea that this grief and regret is good reason enough alone to infantilize women and is to say that women shouldn't have the choice. That in fact, their decision and their choice is still important even though they have consequences. And as a woman, as an adult woman, you should be aware of these choices given that those consequences exist. But yet, at the same time, this is something that is guaranteed. We think that we advise the pro-choice movement in a much more nuanced and strategic manner than in comparison to the other side who worry too much about the sensationalization of the media that already exists. Second, there are very, very important issue. How do we help women who do feel this such grief and do feel such emotional pain? They have paid this little service to this issue, right? They say, well, we'll help them, right? They are support groups out there. But uh, we want to help them, but pro-choice people, pro-choice supporters shouldn't say anything about it. We need to continuously deny it, right? That's a contradictory sort of stance. Because what we have shown you throughout all these papers is that you cannot deny their existence and help them at the same time. And what, what this means and what this translates into is that in, in reality, it is difficult to find support for all these women in the first place because the narrative that exists out there are either conservative women who go out there and say, I regretted this decision, and you know what? They told us so, we shouldn't have done it. Or, in, or, or what happens is that other women who can, uh, can deal with such emotions find it shameful to be able to talk about it. Right? What we say is that on our side, we provide a group of individuals who fight for their choice and say that you made a choice and it was a valid choice, that you're not irrational, you're not irrelevant to the debate and affirm it. For all these reasons, we are very proud to propose. Right, to conclude this debate, can we have the government bill? <laughs> the government side realizes that this activist represents an ideal. And when that ideal is destroyed by an expression of grief and the expression of grief and regret, we think it hurts people on the ground, especially in conservative communities, who have not yet made that choice whether to afford or not. In fact, it increases the barrier towards that woman exercising that choice towards abortion. But let's just think about it. We are all for a realistic portrayal. But that realistic portrayal and the nuanced argument of how you're able to reconcile your decision, reconcile your disappointment with your stance as a pro-choice activist, will never be transmitted towards the people who actually matters in this topic. People who want, who are undecided whether or not they want to get an abortion or not. There are three issues in this debate. Firstly, what are the ideal? Secondly, how does it affect the ground? 
that you hardly be able to see threads across. Let's talk about the general expression of regret in this case. Because when we're talking about the general expression of regret, you are essentially telling the people on the ground, you're essentially telling the people on the ground that you are you are disappointed over the fact that you killed your own baby. What what is the general message of that? Is that it continuously panels with the conservative narrative, it reinforces the narrative that women is people minded. The expression of regret also says that the decision that you made when you when you were born is also an emitting of regret over your irrationality. Also another sign, also another signposting towards the conservative narrative on your weakness as a pro-choice leader in a pro in a pro-choice organization. Ladies and gentlemen, especially on the narrative of women being fickle minded, we think that yes, conservatives <coughs> generally do infantilize women. However, if you take the discussion, if you take the discussion over a general decision over choice, if that decision or that choice does not lead to happiness, you will never be able to convince the conservatives to allow their daughters, to allow their wives, for example, to have that sort of abortion that they might want to do. That momentum will be not existing within this conservative community. We also talk about how it will affect people on the ground about this nuanced argument which will never be transmitted towards them. Why so? Because the conservative media still go off this narrative. They'll run this narrative on how on the, they'll run this soundbite on how this thing is scandalous rather than a nuanced argument towards the people on the ground. What generally happens then is the conservative woman is continuously unable to reinforce their belief within their own community. The only response to that was that there's a liberal media. But the liberal media is only preaching to the already converted, and conservatives never watch liberal media in the first place. But if you're talking about people who actually matter, if you're talking about people who are minorities, liberal minorities, who are living in conservative communities where abortion is very much frowned upon. Ladies and gentlemen, we also talk about how actually being, in general, the message that are coming from the government side is this. That by being realistic about your individual stance, you're actually hurting the ideal of the movement in total. <coughs> the ideal is that by women exercising their choice, you're able to attain general control and general happiness over your own life. Especially if you're talking about leaders who are representative of the entire movement. That personal view, that personal conflict will be conflated with, will be conflicted with the entire movement. Hence, implying towards the rest of the society that you should not make the decision to abort because it will lead you to experiencing massive amount of sadness and regret. Disappointment is dis the message is disappointment is abundant if you exercise this choice, as opposed to portrayal of an ideal that all women, that as all society, all society should aspire towards. Ladies and gentlemen, we are all for realistic portrayal. But not so if this realistic portrayal will never ever be transmitted to its people who actually matter. Uh, so there's two ways we can do this right now. Oh, you want to shake hands for a second? Yes. <laughs> yes. So two ways. Uh, so one option I was hoping was these guys go first, Jenny or always first. Uh, then I come in, and then they can sort of watch uh, me giving it away. Uh, the only problem with that is I'm actually done. So if I can, huh? I'm done. So if I give it now, I actually get to go to the tab room and do things that. Can I have the tone yeah, um, So my question is, how much time do you guys need to come up with the Actually, while giving oral, actually, you can just sit up and. Yeah. So when I'll be doing that, they'll have to go out anyway. How much time do you need? Basically, ten. So you want ten minutes? Okay. Sure. Um. Fine. So you guys can proceed now. Uh, like your oral education. We need to also stop this broadcast, right? Okay.